Philip Jones, Martini Whisperer, and welcome to another weekly instalment of Cocktail Hour Live. So we've covered, if you've seen the last few weeks, we've covered things like the Gibson Martini, the Dirty Martini, shaking, stirring, all those fundamental essential things. But I've got to shift gears tonight. And to you, House of Fletcher. I thought I'd shift gears tonight and talk about these lovelies. And it's not bragging rights. Um, every bottle tells a story. And the branders and marketers in the world Happy gin and clock to you, chaps. I thought I'd break out the bad boys tonight. This is one of my mid-century modern glasses from the 60s. Um, if I fold up to the brim a bit, a third of a bottle, which wouldn't be polite, um, so I'm keeping it tidy. Here's to you. Cheers, everyone. It's a long weekend locally, so let's make the most of that. Tishin. So what I thought I'd do, something a bit different this week around, is to talk about five or so spirits from my collection and um, I'll give you a bit of a guide to tour, uh, and you don't see it all here, just so you know. That would be a bit over top. So um, it's stashed, stashed around the house because you, know, you don't want to show it off. Let me give you a tour. Let's do a flyover, shall we? Let's see if this works. So we have two lovely uh, mid century modern cocktail wagons. There's one there, number one or number two. We also have a bit of a stash in there, emergencies. Now you've got to bear in mind. I can't drink all this, nor would I want to. I like to share it. The whole point of people sending me things to review or to critique um, is to education. I see myself as someone who sits between the distiller and your fine cells and the general market and uh, can extrapolate and educate and advocate on the part of distillers. So a lot of this uh, wonderful stuff here is destined for masterclasses and spirit appreciation events and things like that. Um, and some are a library, a reference library for me. So if I'm looking, uh, so I get a gin to review or a vodka to review, I've got a, a bit of a spectrum here of other things I can refer back to. So believe it or not, this is a spirit sprinkling. I got rid of about 20 bottles. I'm going to make way for a new season of releases coming through. Um, and these poor things are growing under the weight. So let's do a flyover, shall we? In no particular order. So in this part of the bar are my vodkas. So uh, different types of vodka from around the world, both American, um, gosh, uh, then we move on to liqueurs, bourbons, rums, come back to these in a minute, um, some single malts, including some rare releases, which I'm going to touch on today as well. Then we go down below here, and these are my mixes. So we've got Amaro's, Vermouths, uh, Aperitifs, um, Ports, Sherry's, and some very interesting sort of screw ingredients. So that can be a little fun little treasure trove. I'm looking to make a little cocktail or something out of that. Um, I kind of dive into there. Okay. So I'm going to do a little sample of each of these and talk about the story about each one this evening. Then uh, this lovely lady over here is given over to the gin. Voila, I'm going to do it this way. So top flyover. At any given point, I've got about 300 gins in the stash. As it's looking a bit thin at the moment because I've just got rid of a whole bunch. Um, so again, some are library releases, uh, and some are just for me. And then I've also got a stash of here of extra resources, um, special releases, baby bottles, things like that. So what I'm going to do is going to select a few from, I'll get this back where it belongs. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot. But, but as I said, they're all destined to be sharing. So if you were here now, I would love to, no one goes first to eat Martini Whisperer HQ, I assure you. Wouldn't be fair, wouldn't be polite. Hop on a cocktail hour. So let me, um, I'll say before, like every bottle tells a story and the marketers and the branders would play on that a lot in many cases but I think in many cases the spirits is why I'm so fascinated about this industry is in many places it's true and we talk about and I've got some um, spirits from around the world I want to introduce you to and each one has a very interesting backstory and inspired by place so let's get started if you've got a question along the way of course or you want to talk if you see something along here you want to get to know about just let me know and I'll dive in and see what I can do no particular order. I spy my little eye. Let's start with vermouth. This is made an eye vermouth. I know the label's back to front for some reason in the broadcast, but um, this is their sweet vermouth. Some of you may have seen the dry vermouth um, in, used in martinis in bars around Australia. And I've got a soft spot for this particular leaf for two reasons. One is way, way, way back again, before I became Martini Whisperer, I had a little blog thing called Kemba Martini. And at uh, about 2012, 2013, they're looking to have Hunt Canberra's 100th birthday. 
and I was invited to create the official martini for the occasion. So it's right up my alley. So uh, at the time, and we're not talking very long ago, good evening everybody, thanks for tuning in. I'm giving you a tour of my bar and telling stories about five or six special releases that kind of tell, speak the story about how wonderful craft spirits are. So if you see anything on the shelf that you've got to find out about, just let me know. So yes, we're talking about Made Nice Sweet Vermouth. So even not that long ago, we're, not, we're talking eight years or so, there was a handful of gin makers and one vermouth maker in Australia. And of course I wanted uh, all with straight ingredients just for the National Capital's official uh, martini. Long story cut short, I wrote Blind off to Maid and I, a whole bunch of other gin makers and West Winds from WA came back, said, yep, we love, we don't, don't know who you are, but we love the idea, we'll get behind that, and Maid and I as well. So I created two versions of this uh, so-called Centini, Centenary Martini, the Centini, it's called, north side and south side version, and that's a cup of Canberra joke because we've got a lake and people are very tribal about which side of the lake they should sit on. Anyways, we had na it, it just snowballed. It got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And next thing you know, we had our like, equivalent of a premier chief minister launch it. Uh, we had all the media attend. I had a special glass uh, set made by a local glass artist called Peter Minson. We raised, we ended up having a black tie ball, the National Press Club. And we, everyone looked fabulous and all dolled up and we all drank my centinis and north side and south side versions and um and just for the, just for the uh so you know the recipe that it used this one for was the south side so that was a one to three ratio of sweet vermouth to the west winds cutlass gin which is a really punchy navy strength gin bush tomato um uh, with an olive and it was a hit on the night but that's one story the other story just simply has as a product in its own right um so it uses um a whole bunch of native ingredients like wattle seed and strawberry gum. And it's one of those few really luscious things you can just drink, frankly, by itself. It's just beautiful. It's got a beautiful strawberry aroma to it. Um, and the tradition, of course, in Europe, vermouth is drunk chilled or nice. Um, and this is a really, really, that, such a stellar ingredient that um, you can do the same. It's just very gorgeous and aromatic. So, but remember my pro tip about vermouth. Once it's open, you do need to keep it chilled or I vacuum seal it. Um, and I've just got it out here for the this evening. So, made nine, three for move, number one. Where shall we go next? We'll talk about whiskey. Are we going to whiskey fans here? I hope we do, because I talk about gin and vodka, but I actually do a fair bit of work around whiskey. Cheers, everyone. Doing a two of my bar and about five or six spirits this evening. Something different. Down near the um, Victorian border on the Murray, get a calf, is a place in Cora, beautiful little town down the banks of the Murray. Uh, it'd be about close to four hours drive from where I'm sitting. And there's a fantastic old flour mill. And back in the day, it was pretty much dilapidated. And the guys from Cora Distillery, uh, they were able to take it over for a bit of buck and had to resurrect it. Um, so it's a really fantastic industrial heritage site, you know, five story high ceilings, beams, they make chocolate there as well. And they released their own whiskey, among other things. Now, but this is not just any whiskey. Um, the thing to note about here is, is the age, it's 17 years old. And for an Australian single malt whiskey, that's extremely rare. Because although we've been making whiskey off and on for hundreds of years in Australia, um, it's only in modern times that we're getting these releases now. So you are starting to get some 21 year old releases like a Pillow of Sovereign's Cove, and that's, that's the clue here. So the industry, as I said, is very supportive and very collaborative, and these guys are just starting out. And the story goes, but they were able to acquire a bottle of, sorry, a barrel, a barrel of um, single malt whiskey from Sullivan's Cove in Tasmania, which if you know your single malt whiskey, you know how exceptional that is. Uh, and they've, they've been releasing, uh, creating single malt whiskeys from the get-go in the modern era, in the early, early 90s, mid 90s. Somehow or other, this washed up on their doorstep like an orphan, and hence it's called the Bastard Barrel, and it was aged in bourbon casks, um, but distilled in Tasmania. And the thing they told me about, um, that location is the microclimate within this amazing warehouse is really variable very hot very cold the summers all the rest of it so again it's this maturation process so uh, i'm very fortunate to see there's not much left this beautiful stuff seven years old uh, don't ask me much cost cost it's not cheap and you can't buy it anyway so this is bottle number 398 of 450. so i'm saving this for the last bit for some really rainy days and special occasions so the guys at Cora, if you get down there, it's worth a visit. It's a fantastic setup and they're great blokes. And they make their, they've got their own releases now. Um, so this has kind of gotten started. So look out for Cora 
single malt, but you can't buy this. This is mine. Sorry, sorry. So we're done for Moof. We're done vodka. Something completely different. Uh, welcome everybody who's been tuning in. I'm going to give you a tour of my bar in about five or six different types of spirits. And if you see something that you like, um, I can talk about that too. Cheers to you. What's next? Something really interesting. We're still in Australia, but I'm going to switch countries in a little bit while longer. Um, in, the, in Adelaide Hills, uh, there are a couple, Brendan and Claire, who make the distillery out of Applewood. They're winemakers and, and then they also make spirits. And some of you may have heard of Applewood gin, personal favorite of mine, it's my top 10 Australian craft gins. They're great to look up and learn about and there's some articles on my website of course about all this. And they've got a big commitment to sustainability, environmental production of what they do and working with native ingredients. And so, what has happened in the last few years is we've had our gins and a vodka craze. Now, and the vermouth, we just touched on, you're getting ingredients, so Amaro, so think Campari. Think, you know, something in between there. It's got bitterness to it, herbaceous and herbs. It's designed over a neat or a mixer or a digestive. So that was pretty much the first to come along. There's a couple others that popped up around the same time around the new area. And they create this beautiful stuff called Oka, Australian Amaro. Now I'm gonna just reach down for a sec. And this is a, another early release, and this is a clue. So it's the new label, that's the old label, and I've got another bottle besides. So it's from colour, again, it's hidden down there somewhere. What you'll notice is the colour profile, because they're a little bit different. They're small batch, they're small batch producers, hand foraged, uh, additionally sourced, sustainably sourced botanicals. And uh, this has for things like, we've got a label, bunion nut, uh, Davidson plums, rye berries, finger limes, Strawberry gum, like the Made Nice Wheat Vermouth, for example. Peppermint gum, wild thyme, wattle seed, and other things besides. So you think of it as a very luscious, aromatic, botanical Campari, but better. Without that really sharp bitterness to it. So it's just absolutely lovely. Um, but there's variation each year because if it's, if it's all seasonal produce. So you can actually now make your own Australian Negroni with your own sweet vermouth, an amorous is in the middle instead of your capari, and of course, any Aussie gin you like. So um, they're absolute geniuses and super lovely people to boot, and they make some really great products. So anything from Applewood, I love, um, but look out for Oka as well. So again, if you want to make your own Australian Negroni, that's the stuff you want. Very distinctive flavor profile. It's not like you'd expect, but it's just gorgeous. Okay, so we've done a little tour here. We've done this little trolley here with my vodka single malts, we could talk rum a bit later, vermouths in our mixes, ouzos, etc. All sorts of good stuff hiding in there. Shall we talk about gin? Let's talk about gin. Voila. So, if you're just joining in, I'm just doing a quick tour of my bar. You do smoke some uh, Juno gin, uh, voila. This one here. I was um, fortunate to be asked by Gourmet Traveller Wine to write an article last year about New Zealand gins. So. It's there somewhere on the web. And uh, I had the privilege, hopefully again this year, all things being well, um, to judge the Craft Spirit Awards in New Zealand in Wellington. So I was the first international judge to be invited to go across for that. Um, yes, we're definitely doing gin, don't worry. We're going, going deep into gin. So yes, so New Zealand gins across the board, and there's a list of all New Zealand gin makers on our website, just by the by on the homepage, in case you're interested. This links back to their respective websites. Um, I'm across the board generally very impressed with New Zealand gin. Um, again, they have very different botanicals to us. They have their own native botanicals they're exploring with, just the same way Australian producers are. Some more successful than others, but on the crossboard, there's a finesse to New Zealand gin that is very impressive. Um, and fun fact about these guys is very clever. Um, they're, uh, they're partnered with Massey, Massey, I'm gonna say that's wrong, Massey? They're at Taranaki, Massey University to identify great sources of juniper. Um, to then clone the DNA to have the best commercial plantations of juniper berries, which seems like, why aren't we doing this? So, do you know, really good. Um, again, they use uh, the Monica Lees and um, their own version of pepper berries. Um, what's it called? Uh, I got it wrong. I'm going to say it's got Horopito or something like that. Horopito, excuse my, um, my mispronunciation. But uh, terrific stuff. And they do a lot of seasonal releases as well. Anything New Zealand, I like Scape Grace as well. Um, it's another exceptional release. So yeah, you're all spotted. 
One um, of the genes I want to talk to you about is I5 my little eye, this one here. This is a long way from home. This is all the way from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, Wheeler's uh, dry gin, Western dry gin. Now, if you follow me on Instagram, you know a bit of like two things. It's green chili uh, martinis, clearly. And, um, oh, you're welcome, Faye babe. Um, where was I? Yes. And I got to go to New Mexico a couple of years ago, and it felt like a second home to me. It's the uninitiated, it's in between Texas and Arizona. Santa Fe itself is quite high up, it's about 10,000 feet up. Uh, desert climate, beautiful, gorgeous city, lots of museums and galleries and great bars. And this distillery. And they have, uh, and they gave me a very generous day with them, um, tasting, and they've got a gorgeous little tasting room downtown Santa Fe, and I made a martini, because I had to, using their ingredients and things like that. So I love chili there, so I had, had a good time, shall I say. But this is very, very distinct, um, because it's a unique climate there, even in the distillery itself, it's quite high up, like I said, so the evaporation rate for the whiskey is huge. So they actually have a humidifier. Um, okay, Texas friends. Yeah, so if you can track this down, I'll tell you why it's interesting, and I reckon friends from Texas will like this, because, I'm just reading from notes here. Um, so they, it's all hand foraged, again, small batch. So small bottles, not huge production. And they use local juniper, a white desert sage, uh, chola cactus blossoms, and an osha root, I'm saying O-S-H-A, which is um, traditional Native American herb, apparently uh, around Taos, which is north of um, Santa Fe. They noticed that the bears that come out of hibernation would eat lots of it, and it's quite good for you, apparently. So um, it, this is a really hard to pin down and describe. It's not like super herbaceous, uh, but on the palate, it's quite rich, and you're getting these beautiful kind of sweet sort of cactus flavors. Um, and it's just absolutely gorgeous. And the sage notes really, really come through. So a question, uh, do I record these? I absolutely do, absolutely do. So this will be saved, and it'll go on my YouTube channel on Wednesday evening about five o'clock. So look up, from, oh, there's about 40 videos there. So I've got little video clips on just quick reviews, and also I keep these things, because I figure people can't stick around all night. So yes, this is saved, and it'll end up on my YouTube channel. So um, this is just, I say this clearly for special occasions. It's just really, really special. It's not a martini, Gin at all, it's a sipping gin. Um, and the, if you go to Santa Fe, you're welcome. Special place. Moving on, let's go to Germany. I've been saving this again for a few years. So I'm thinking 2013, if I could be wrong. Um, I got to go to Berlin for Christmas. Super cold, but I made the best of it and uh, met a whole bunch of uh, German distillers over there, one of which was these lovely people from Berliner Brandstifter. Now, I'll, I'll pronounce that badly again. Um, but it's all sorts of cultural, because it's Berlin, there's cultural references to everything that they do. So again, this, the theme of the day is um, the backstories and the inspiration behind the spirits, you know, and that's why I love them so much. So they're actually quite young, can be gin making in Germany is actually not a, it's quite a new thing, shall we say. We know them for schnapps and, or the various kind of um, fruit driven or um, other things they drink. So gin itself is actually quite new. So these two I've dropped in the scene um, 2009, and now there's a whole plethora of really interesting uh, German craft gins. But even then at the time when I met them, which was about five years later, um, they were still just grafting it out. They were a small producer, had the big uh, relationships with different bars, different hotels, just to get stocked. Now they're quite much more well established and they've got a really nice range, so look out for them. Um, but very interesting in terms of they use uh, a seven, seven, um, seven fold filtration process, um, organic grain, so it's a wheat based spirit. Uh, all the botanicals come in 50, 50 kilometres of Berlin itself, so they go, go and hand forage them as well. But like the, the guys, and they use cucumber, elderflower, wood ruff, and malve, and I don't even know what malve is. But the bottom line is you get a very fragrant, gentle, subtle, aromatic gin. Just gorgeous, lovely mouthfeel to it. So um, this is the last of what I kept. I drank the rest over the years. But um, but Berlin uh, Brandstifter, and by the way, there's a reference to the people who burnt down the Reichstag. Hold on the story. So, so there's an article on my site, deep down, if you want to have a look for it, I'll give me more detail. So they gave me like really generous of their time. 
and uh, it's great to see even then this craft gin movement emerging in a very traditional kind of distilling place. And now, of course, they're, they're very well established. That's great. Now, question coming in. Um, how do you know so much and where do you live? Are you familiar with Sam and Treadway? Um, good questions. Uh, the last question is no, I don't know Sam and Treadway, fortunately. Um, how do I know so much? I drink for a living. That's probably the easiest answer I could do for that. Uh, where do I live? Canberra, Australia. So the national capital of Australia. So um, I suspect I'll be here for quite some time. I'd love to get back to America. I haven't been, I haven't been to Texas and I would definitely want to go back to New Mexico. So here's for flying again sometime soon. Here's to you. So we've done Oka, Amaro. We've done Vermouth. We've done Single malt Whiskey. We've done a couple of gins. Uh, let me see. This is something very different. We'll come back to this one here. And this is a fantastic bottle. And there's a sister bottle, which is hiding. There it is. Voila. So this is a relatively new release. It popped up a couple months ago from the south coast of New South Wales, which is about three hours drive from where I'm sitting, um, from the Headlands Distillery. Um, and what the key thing about this release is that they're hand foraged, very small batch. This gin, for example, um, is only one of them. They make 100 bottles at a time, 1,000 bottles a year. So it's a bit special to get. Gorgeous looking thing. Um, but the key thing is it's called uh, Bubiala and it uses native juniper. So this is a very unique product in Australia. Um, very unique product in Australia in terms of it's the only gin with the exception of one other possibly out of Kangaroo Island that uses uh, native juniper. And uh, it's gin, but not as you know it. So when I put it in front of people who don't know what it is, they go, this is really good, but I don't know what it is. So it's a completely different flavor of profile. Um, but they're very clever chaps. And um, there's a review on the site. Again, I'm not bait clicking, but if you want to get more detail, it's there. Likewise, there's, there's a two part, because they make a fantastic vodka as well for that matter. Oh, we should talk about vodka, shouldn't we? Um, and this is Dugal, again, additions inspired Illawarra plum. So hand foraged, it's the gin, but they steep the plums in here. So this is almost like a liqueur, like semi liqueur kind of vibe. It's really delicious. Again, when I'm writing or judging or reviewing craft spirits, especially from whatever country, it can be hard to get your head around it because the flavor profiles, as opposed to, say, an English gin, are completely unique. So the adjectives. So I've got some question, more questions coming through. Um, that would be swell. I would love that. Is the Juniper Jamo native? It is. So it's, it's, um, the question was, is the Juniper they use native to the Illawarra? Yes, it is. They actually go out and get it themselves. It's very different. It's quite a green little thing. It's not purple like a Juniper berry. So yeah. So if you're tuning in and if you missed a bit, don't worry, this is recorded and it'll be saved to my YouTube channel and I'll upload on Wednesday night. I'm giving you a tour of my bar, probably for another 10 minutes or so, because um, this is getting low and I'm getting thirsty of my bar in about five or six different spirits. So we've touched on vermouth, amaro, um, should we talk about rum for a minute? Rum is a thing. I was doing a series of rum events here locally to introduce people, because in Australia, rum has a bit of a baggage, shall we say. Um, but there's a whole new wave of people who make great rums in Australia uh, in the last several years, and really needs to be really looked at as a whole new spirit category, because it's so versatile. Um, so yes, so this is called Husk Distillery. They're up in the, uh, in the, in the border of New South Wales and Queensland, but inland. So they're sugarcane farmers. So this is what Australia's a few um, paddock to bottle, as they say, releases, especially in terms of actually rum. But this is a slightly different name. It's called Agrigol. So you'll notice here, um, A-G-R-I-C-O-L-E. Without getting into gory details, there are different styles of rum, depending on the cultural, whether it's a French, you know, ancestry in the Caribbean or British or whatever, Spanish. Um, slightly different approaches to um, the way they make rum. Agrigol is crushed pure sugar cane. So it misses all those steps around molasses, etc., etc. Bottom line, what do you get? So tradition, they would just drink this neat, ice, lime, lots of lime juice and some mint. It's quite rich on the palate. It's quite, um, it's up there. It's 52% ABV, yeah, 50% ABV, as opposed to like 42% something. So you know you're drinking it. It's good for a mixer, um, but it's a unique product. And these guys are a family run business. You can go visit them, uh, I think now. And um, gorgeous product. They make a few different things, but the Echo Gold is unique in Australia. So I love introducing this to people when I do sessions because it's such an outlier in terms of other styles. 
I think it might be from here. Should we do one for the road? I'm gonna take a quest now. Um, do you wanna do another gin, whiskey, vodka, rum? What'd you like to hear about? Ask away. It was always done. Do two of my bar. We'll do a fly round again if you want. Jammo Center. Good for you. So, mixes down here. All sorts of weird ones, varieties. Again, this is not everything, but this will keep me out of trouble for another few weeks, I think. Gin, gin, gins around the world. Little gins down here, and I've got secret stashes around the house for a rainy day. The question was, what are my top three gins? Oh, God. L Lucky. Personal choice, of course, yes. Um, okay, so there's, there's gins you respect. There's gins you just kind of drink because they float your boat, right? Um, martini gins, so the things I probably go for the most of. Plymouth, daggy green bottle. I always decant it in the deco bottle. Uh, so Plymouth gin, uh, because it's just subtle, closely woven, elegant. It's been around forever and a day. Um, and I can dress it up and dress it down to a martini and I just know no matter how bad my day has been, that would be it. Um, another gin would be, it's not on the, on the bar here, it's out of stock. Um, it's Able Force Bathtub Gin. It's another English gin. It comes in what looks like a brown paper bottle, uh, brown paper wrapping around the bottle of like fan handwriting. So it's a bathtub gin, which basically means it's been infused with a whole bunch of herbs and spices. When you look at it in the glass, it's almost like a pale green hue. It's light, delicate. You sip it on ice. It's just perfection. Absolutely gorgeous gin. Number three, oh my goodness. Um, probably Kenobi. Kenobi gin out of um, Japan. Again, that's not present because I drank that too. Sorry. Um, out of Kyoto. And the whole Japanese gin thing is a whole new wave as well. So again, I've put a list of Japanese gin makers on my site, which took a while to put together, by the way, because uh, they're not always kind of, you know, accessible as gin makers are here. So it's come out of Kyoto. I've, it's English uh, gin makers, distillers, expertise on the mix. Come out of a very deep sake tradition. Um, but the gin is like wine. It comes in a black bottle, it's very expensive. Uh, they make a few different varieties and um, it's a super elegant, almost like, yeah, it's like a Montrachet of gins. So, pin me to the floor, if that's the Freya I had to drink, that would probably be it. That's a question. Yeah, so there you are. So, one last question and then I'll let you guys go home. Um, should we talk about a vodka? How about a vodka? Let's do a vodka. We're doing a two of my bar friends. Uh, so, we talked about Amaro, like the Applewood. Um, the Oka from um, up in the Adelaide Hills, gorgeous gins from the South Coast, or innovative gins down from the South Coast, New South Wales. Um, very interesting craft gin releases from Berlin and New Mexico, in the United States, etc. Um, here's one for the road. Come back to your um, question about uh, free pillars in a, in, a, in a moment, if I may our fire drum. I'm not even sure you can buy this anymore. So Amanda Beck is the lady behind this, Tasmanian, and she got this made at Sullivan's Cove again, coming full circle about our whiskey stories earlier. And uh, she wanted to create a vodka that was true to its Eastern European roots, but very pristine and elegant. And we know there's like vodka and there's vodka. So the net result is it's a very organic, very malty kind of, so really grainy, toasty grain, a lot of rye, notes on the top, but it's been uh, charcoal filtered several times, I think fire from memory, and um, so you get a really pristine, clean vodka, so you're not going to feel it too badly, but you've got lots of luscious flavour notes. So this is a very sipping, it's not a martini vodka, it's a sipping vodka. So if you're a gin drinker and you hate vodka, you may want to think about trying this. Um, it's fine, it's fantastic, I really like it. Um, four pillars, uh, four pillars, four pillars. Um, before I get to it. Fun fact, so I bought the first, one of the first hundred bottles of Four Pillars ever released. They did a possible crowdfunded kind of thing back in the day. Uh, went, oh my God, it's exciting. Because it's just, again, when Australian gins were just starting to take off. And I just, my blog, I was just getting started. So I got bottled number, no, number 11 or something like that. Very excited. And uh, I've met the guys and been there and that's all fun. They can look after themselves in many ways. I don't talk about them too much simply because they've got the marketing budget and they've got the people behind them and, you know, I like telling the story about the people who maybe, you know, these are small operators, 
husband and wife teams, rural region Australia, single person operations. So I kind of see myself as doing my bit to tell their story, while someone at Four Pillars can really kind of look after themselves, if you know what I'm saying. Um, that said, that gin, um, I think the trend is really what I might call sipping gins. So, we, you know, martinis are great and gin tonics are fun. But if it's got richness and viscosity and complexity, then just drink it on a nice big cube of ice, big chunky cube of ice, and see how you go with that. There you go. So I might just leave that there, my friends. We've had fun. I hope you enjoyed yourself. Um, I could go on and on and talk about my bar, but that'd be embarrassing. So here's to you and yours. Happy long weekend if you're a local. Um, if you're overseas, here's to better times. And again, thank you so much for tuning in. And